money your call. I have a question about fixed interest ETFs. What happens to bond ETFs as interest rates rise? Uh, for example, Vanguard fixed income ETF VAF and VGB, Aussie government bonds and corporate bonds. Will the price of the ETF go down to balance the rise in interest rates to make the investment more appealing? Will it remain unchanged? How do the dynamics work for a fixed inc fixed interest ETF? Is it worth investing in a bond ETF now or should I be waiting until interest rates go up? Um, how would you approach that, Mark? You know, yeah, look, it's, it's, it's a really good question. So I, you know, I didn't know the performance of the Vanguard funds that he was talking about. And you look at the, the performance of those funds and VGB for the last three months, this is before fees, was down 3.3%. And the on that, in, in respect to Vanguard, and I know no one at Vanguard, their fees are so minuscule. They're, it's it's they're, tiny. Yeah, their fees are like usually around about 10 basis point, points. No, point, point, 20 basis points 20 to 25, basis. and then there's other additional costs as well. So I oh, think, is it? Yeah, okay. so I think it's around about 30 basis points right. from what, from so what I can see. It's down how much? 3.1? 3.3 yep. in the last three months, and, and the, the corporate bond funds, which has obviously got a, a bit bigger yield to carry the, the fall, is, so that's down 1.4% in the last three months. Yep. Um, so it, that answers Nick's question, do they fall in a higher rate environment? Absolutely. Yep. So you've, you've, you've seen that in terms of the declines there, in terms of the, their performance. Um, so James, they, you, as, as rates go higher, you lose money. That's, that's a given. So that's what happens in the bond market. That's why people panic about the bond market. So, And, and to, be, you know, to be fair and look over that over a longer period of time, you know, the, the government bond fund 12-month return is around about 2.5%. But the, the running yield, or so the yield to maturity is only around about 2.4%. Right. So that, I mean, that to me sounds incredibly low for a bond fund. You know, yep. you know, when you've got 10-year government bond, obviously probably maybe higher duration, yep. 2.7%. 2.8, 10-year uh, Aussie government bond. Um, so that'll have a lot of short data duration in there, and that's why you're getting very poor outcomes in terms of cash flow. Exactly. So, you know, we've, we talked about this before the show in terms of, you know, passive investments and our ETS very useful for bond funds and in a more illiquid market and where there's kind of a few more idiosyncrasies in terms of pricing and, and those opportunities, I think it's, it's worthwhile paying for an active fund manager to spot those, especially on the corporate credit side, because I think there's some pricing anomalies, which typically these bond funds won't do, because they'll try and match the index that they're benchmarked to. And they do a pretty good job of benchmarking against the index as well. So are these the domain, uh, who, ETFs, everyone loves them, it's, it's obviously Vanguard have done an incredibly good job. Are they the domain more of larger investors in this part of the world in terms of those, those instruments? And should people who are looking at this look at whether it be securities on the hybrid market, whether it be sub debt on the hybrid, but listed sub debt, whether it be what you guys offer, is that the way you think about it in terms of getting conservative outcomes, better outcomes for conservative buckets? Is that how you look at it? Yeah, I mean, I guess think, thinking about the, the MIPS portfolio that we run, we've got a lot more floating rate, short dated, but obviously higher yielding, higher risk. Um, you know, corporate bonds in there rather than government bonds. And government bonds have been hit because we've, we've seen a fairly significant, you know, jump in the yield curve in, in the, across the spectrum from two years to, you know, 20 but or 30 years. it's important to mention for the viewers here that the government bond curve is a fixed rate curve. Correct. So that's, that's why it's hurt. So that, in other words, what Mark's talking about is a floating rate curve isn't affected by, the, if, as the rates go up, you make more money. You, you, your cash flow is higher. So people are actually going to buy the floaters because they're saying, I'm getting a better outcome on the higher rates. It's that's right, yeah. So, so you, you, when you're buying a floating rate, that's on a margin of plus 200, 300 basis points over either swaps or um, BBSW um, and uh, bank bill swap rate. And as that rises in terms of a rising interest rate environment yep. and, and as the yield curve prices in potential future increases in central bank rates, that rate goes up and you get a higher coupon when yep. it does reset. Absolutely. Happy days. Um, makes sense? Completely. Saying, it's, it's hard to work out why you'd buy an ETF. I, I can see that you'd buy something that you can't access. I think that's where the ETF plays. If you wanted to buy emerging market fixed income or global, buy those. Yeah, if I mean, it's, a, if if that's it's a, an asset class mark that diversifies your portfolio, I can see why people would yeah. go for it. So, James, if you're thinking about waiting, uh, you know, we'll talk a, a little bit after the next ad break about where interest rates are in the Trump rally. But if you're trying to get into fixed income, there are an array of ways you can get into it. You can get listed stuff, you can find brokers, 
you can call these guys, you can call the NAB. There's an array of different ways to do it. Um, we've got a couple of minutes and I just want to get your sense of how does the market feel? You've both spoken about rallies, you've spoken about issuers. I keep looking to the VIX as a, as a precursor to volatility. There's none. How does it feel for the rest of the year? Do you feel that there's a, there's a level of comfort about the market or you're distrustful of the market? Well, in my part of the market, Mark, I'm a little bit more um, uh, relaxed, I think, than the guys that uh, buy Invest. and sell senior bonds. Uh, those guys need to mark to market every day. But um, consequently, I noticed you, you used the word complaints, complacent when you were sending me the notes earlier. And yeah, it, it's, it feels like it's complacent. Well, I, I guess the question is, what does it have to be... What, what would cause it not to be complacent? A you've tweet. got... Yeah, you've got, you've got Trump and you've got Brexit or, or enacting Brexit through uh, Rule 50 or whatever it is. And uh, I think that's fine, but when you think about Trump, he's, he's just doing what he said he'd do, which, was, which is America for Americans, and uh, I'm going to start doing things for America first. So. We've got one minute. The market complacency, does it, does, is it a basis of some concern for you? The fact that the market, equity markets, all markets seem to be going in one direction, everyone's saying this is going to rally on, or how does that feel to you? Yeah, I, I think it is. I think the market is complacent. And interestingly, Moody's chief economist has written an article in, in this week's Moody's Credit Outlook saying VIX is low, overvaluation risk is not. So essentially he's saying equities are looking a bit toppy. We've had the rally. Is it fundamentals to justify it? Probably not, so there's volatility around the corner in my okay. view. We'll go to a quick break. Leah's talking to me about a wrap it. It's wrapped. Talk to you soon.